I'd like to welcome everyone to this evening's Native Plant Society of New Jersey Wednesday webinar series. Uh, my name is Randy Eckel. I'm the president of the Native Plant Society of New Jersey. And uh, before we get started, I want to do a little ad for some upcoming webinars that we'll be having. Uh, in September, we're going to be taking a few months off this summer while we all enjoy the great outdoors in our own gardens, um, at least a few months off from our Wednesday webinar series. Uh, we'll be back in September. On September 21st, we'll have Pandora Young. She's going to talk about uh, plant species that have adapted to climate change, which is, uh, I'm really excited to hear that one. Um, she uh, is a land steward and ecology technician at Longwood Gardens. And I'm really excited to hear what she has to tell us about that. Um, the next month, uh, we will be having uh, Sam Hoadley, uh, Mike, I think you need to advance that slide there for me, if you would be so yep. kind. There we go. Uh, we'll have Sam Hoadley, who's the manager of horticultural research at the Mount Cuba Center. Um, and he's going to uh, be talking about some, uh, some really terrific native plants and cultivars for our region. Um, one other quick ad for everyone uh, on the next slide here. I do want to give a little bit of shout out. Um, but if you're not a member of the Native Plant Society of New Jersey, I hope you'll consider becoming a member. Uh, we have a lot of chapters all throughout uh, the state of New Jersey that offer field trips, meetings, uh, sometimes field trips to some really interesting locations, um, all kinds of activities. Uh, so you can get together with other folks that are interested in native plants. And being a member of the Native Plant Society of New Jersey also supports this webinar series. So we hope that you'll uh, consider joining us. Just go to npsnj.org and you can find out a lot about the Native Plant Society of New Jersey, as well as click on the membership link there and become a member. Uh, membership starts just at $20. It's quite a deal. So having said all that, uh, without further ado, uh, I would like to introduce tonight's speaker. Uh, tonight we have Mike Van Cleff with us. Um, I've known Mike for more than 25 years at this point. The first time I remember meeting him, and I, uh, I don't know if it was exactly the first time I met him, but the first time I remember meeting him, he was clutching a bunch of containers of tiny little seedlings of native plants in his hands and sharing them with me, uh, which, was, which was a wonderful thing. Um, he's been involved in native plants and invasive species management for a very long time. He's the uh, stewardship director of uh, FOVOS, which is the Friends of Hopewell Valley Open Space. Um, but he's also uh, the co-founder actually of the Invasive Species Strike Team, um, started back in 2007. And Mike has an enormous amount of experience over the years of dealing with rare native plants, beautiful native plants, as well as the invasive species that are really wreaking havoc um, in some of our habitats in New Jersey. So without further ado, I'd like to turn the presentation over to Mike. We'll be answering questions at the end. Please be sure if you have questions, type them in the Q&A box. And uh, a few questions will be dealt with during the presentation, but mostly we'll be uh, peppering Mike with a few questions um, at the end. So Mike, please take away the show. All right, thank you. Okay, so yeah, I, I, uh... This is this is a pleasant pleasant presentation for me because we're going to focus a lot on native plants, but you know obviously the uh, the bad news slips in along the way. But we'll try to scurry through those slides and get to the native stuff. Um, so just very quickly, I'll give her a little rundown on the strike team. Um, our mission is to protect natural lands through coordinated strategic invasive species management, and um, you know a lot of that work revolves around early detection, rapid response for newly emerging species. Um, these are the kind of things we do, mapping, data analysis, reporting, outreach, uh, training, and my personal favorite, searching for and eradicating invasive species. Um, we have a staff, it's a lot of people, and that is great, lots of different experiences, but we are definitely all part-time. So it's not quite as, as, uh, <laughs> as robust as the entire list seems, um, but we do have a lot of good people um, we also have a four member steering committee that uh, helps us sort of look at things from the statewide perspective. And we have a very uh, important technical advisory committee meeting uh, committee that um, 
that helps us figure out which species to list. If there's been any changes in a species status over the course of a year, we meet annually and update the lists. And um, I spent a lot of time today and hopefully tomorrow I'll finish off preparing our 2022 list, updated list. And we'll have that on our website. Um, and yeah, the, the, the whole point of it all, um, and I obviously assume that folks that are part of the Native Plant Society get this already, but the point of it is there's so many good things. That's why we're concerned about invasive species. Um, just, it's just sort of magnificent how many good things are, are still here in New Jersey. Uh, yeah, lots of native plants, lots of different, you know, the fauna is pretty diverse as well from federally endangered bog turtles, the globally rare northern meadowlark butterflies, the timber rattlesnakes, bobcats, bears, uh, lots of dragonflies in New Jersey. We have a very healthy dragonfly diversity. Um, so yeah, clearly lots of things worth protecting out there. And I think one of the overarching goals um, you know, beyond sort of rare species and one species at a time kind of thoughts is we need healthy systems. Um, we need healthy forests that would resist invasions. And, um, you know, between the, the interactions between overabundant deer, invasive species, and, you know, currently, and then past agricultural land use, you know, those are the three big things that really hamper our native flora and fauna. <clears throat> and of course, you know, we're New Jersey, we have, we've had some development. Um, you know, this is the, the latest data through 2015. And you can see, you know, what, what's going on out there, you know, you can see that regional planning has a positive effect. Um, and there's still a lot left in New Jersey that is unprotected and undeveloped. I mean, out of roughly 5 million acres, 2 million is still still up for grabs. So we have a lot to do protecting the land itself, as well as doing stewardship on that protected land. And yeah, just a quick rundown. We've, we've made a mess. There's no two ways about it. We're all part of the, this mess that's been made. Um, you know, and I mentioned a few things already, but you know, on top of that, altered fire regimes, we've really limited the, the, the role of fire that, that was in effect for probably over 10,000, 15,000 years up until about a few hundred years ago um climate change etc cetera, etc cetera. um so there's plenty of room for us to do stewardship including on our own properties by planting native um as far as non-native plants you know this just gives you a sense of the scale about 10,000 introductions about 1,000 established in our flora about 48 are widespread invasives and unfortunately there's almost twice that amount um, that are emerging invasive plant species so as bad as the problem is, what this basically says is it could get significantly worse, unfortunately. Um, and I think we all probably know the basics of an invasive species. Um, you know, deer don't eat them as a huge, huge block barricade for non-native plants. If they're eaten like native plants do, then they're unlikely to become invasive when you have such an overabundance of deer. And the basic weedy characters. They tolerate a wide variety of soils, a wide variety of light. They mature quickly and produce lots of seeds. That's sort of the basic characters of an invasive species. And I think this is this is when I like to sit on for a couple of seconds, this slide. But you know, I, I chose probably one of the invasive species that has, you know, clear um, values to it clear interaction with the, even the native and, and non-native flora fauna. Um, so they produce copious amounts of flowers in May and they are often heavily um, visited by, by pollinators, bees. Um, in September and October, they produce abundant fruit crops that are eaten by anything from chickadees to black bears. Um, and I think, you know, the, the main, you, if you have an abandoned field, olive often is what We'll, we'll fill it up. And, you know, this is a, just a very small subsample of native species that could be in that same place and that in the past were in those places. And you get the gist, you know, if I'm a pollinator, I probably need food more than just one month out of the year. <laughs> if I'm something, an animal that eats fruit, I probably need to eat more than just in September and October. 
And you know that that shrinking of the the calendar, uh, the shrinking of the available resources, is obviously uh, uh, plays a role in why we our bird population has been reduced by a third in the last 50 years, and similar significant reductions in the insect population. You know this is all part of it, and it's it's sort of that deer don't allow this to happen. And then you get this really broken, truncated food web. So yeah, just to give you a little more emphasis on this, the deer density pre-European was about 10 per square mile. It had gone down to close to zero by 1900 because of unregulated commercial hunting. By 1972, it was back where it was before the Europeans got here. And now we deal commonly in, in large in portions of the state with over 100 per square mile, or sometimes at best 50 per square mile. These are unsustainable amounts of deer. And you know, prior to the 1950s, you know, a few species were invasive species were recorded. You know, if you look at, at, at uh, old botanical surveys of places, I did a project at Watchung Reservation. They mentioned Japanese honeysuckle is the only invasive clearly invasive species, you know, 70 years ago. Um, and, you know, even in barberry and still grass, they're, they're not that, that old. Um, and the older I get, the easier it is to say that, I guess. <laughs> but, you know, in, in nature's point of view, it's a blink of an eye. Um, 1980s is when still grass and barberry really expanded. Um, so yeah, this is this is a relatively new problem from nature's perspective. And you know, we get forests that are that are chewed up. You know, we don't get too much of the good. We get this empty forest syndrome where the land had not been tilled in the past, and the deer just have stripped out all of the understory plants. And then this worst case scenario on post-agricultural soils where you just get a tangle of invasive junk. Um, you know, and, and it just, you know, we have way too much of this one and this one and very little of this one. And, and we're struggling mainly because of deer overabundance and how it interacts with um, susceptibility of the land to invasives. <clears throat> so like I said, we like to focus on emerging invasives. Um, in some parts of the state, Japanese Aurelia is not emerging. In other parts, it still is. But any plant that has the potential to become a widespread invasive species are things that we really need to focus on. Um, as of last year, 2021, we had 136 target invasive, target emerging species. Uh, this included um, stage zero species, which have less than 10 known populations in the state. And then stage one is less than 10 to 100, et cetera, et cetera. So you can see how our, our list breaks down. A lot of it is emphasizing species that are not very widespread yet, but have the potential. Uh, we also have some watch species, a significant amount. And unfortunately, there are 92 widespread species that includes plants and animals, pests, pathogens, et cetera. So, you know, like I said, we try to focus our work on, on early detection, rapid response. As, as much as I like to think I am a spectacular, amazing ecologist and restoration ecologist, if I let this all go to this and then have to restore it, the meadow is not going to be anything close to as good as it would it was if I just got in here and killed this before it destroyed this natural meadow. Um, you know, a natural meadow is almost always going to be better than a restored meadow. And you know it's up to us to recognize when something of value is threatened and get it out there quickly, early, before significant damage occurs. And sort of summing up the stewardship hierarchy, you know, you, we really have to get much more serious at a statewide level in reducing the deer population so our native species have a chance. Um, and then you start thinking about invasive species, and you start on the ones that are not very widespread yet, trying to contain them as much as possible, protect the highest conservation value areas. And then you get, you know, to a sort of a peak of restoration, which typically requires, you know, a lot more funding than, than either of these two things. 
So here's just a quick snapshot of what we've searched 800,000 acres, 20,000 detections, 5,000 eradications. And I'd like to emphasize, um, there are some really, really amazing volunteer stewardship teams out there in New Jersey, and just really dedicated people doing an amazing amount of work. They basically have adopted a particular park and they just repeatedly go at it over and over and over again. And, um, you know, I know this quote um, from, a, from a land steward colleague in the past is, is just absolutely true. You know, if you look at something and say, what could I do about this? And, oh, it is such an overwhelming problem. Well, it's not as overwhelming as you think if you look long-term and work very hard on a regular basis. Things can get better with, with effort. And just a couple of pictures of from Duke Farms, you know, so they have a, a deer exposure in some areas. They have an amazing deer management program outside of their fence. So still grass stops trees from germinating. Mm, no, I think it's the deer. When you when you reduce the deer or eliminate the deer, all of a sudden all these hickory seedlings are overtopping Japanese still grass. You know, and eventually Japanese still grass goes away when you have a developed understory. Um, look at any of the, or the majority of the um, deer exposures at South Mountain Reservation, for example. Um, I did a baseline survey and then went back, I guess, five or six years later, and I had to keep checking my notes that said, you know, huge amounts of still grass were in this plot last time you were here, Mike. And I'd be like, wait a minute, there's, there's almost nothing here now. Maybe I got the plot number wrong and I'm going through my pages. Like, no, wait, it goes away. It absolutely goes away when you start developing uh, an understory. Barberry doesn't stand much of a chance either. You know, when you have less deer impact, you get, and this is outside of a deer exposure to the spot, you got these oaks, uh, oak uh, seedlings, ash seedlings, spice bush, all kinds of things. This little thing down here is a much diminished and soon to be vanquished Japanese barberry. You know, so we have to start, you know, thinking about strategies that work on a bigger scale. Sure, we need to knock out and treat as many invasives as we can, but the bigger win is going to be reducing significant reduction of the deer herd. Um, that is really going to get us, uh, we need our native plants to be basically controlling invasive species, and, and it can happen. So moving on to our topic of the day, um, the native species, all right, so sure, they're adapted to our local climate, but, you know, our climate is changing, so we have to sort of, you know, it's not changing minute by minute as far as species distribution, but things are already starting to move. Um, umbrella magnolias that are native south of us are absolutely establishing um, by themselves right now. So yeah, most of our species are obviously they're locally adapted, but we can expect as time goes on that we'll be getting some more Southern species joining us. Um, they require little care. If you don't care exactly how your garden looks, <laughs> if you don't want it to be, um, if you want it to be manicured, then then it requires care. Um, there's no two ways about that. You know, if you want to have a meadow patch, absolutely that requires little care. Um, but you know, the, you obviously have to care for things if you want them to be manicured looking. Um, adapted to pests and pathogens, sure, and within reason, right? The main reason we we value our native plants is because they are functionally part of the ecosystem. So, you know, they, they, they do get holes in them. They do get leaves chewed. They do get pathogen attacked. But, you know, we tolerate, we want to be able to say, we tolerate that because we respect that they're part of the food web. Um, lots of invasive species don't get pests and pathogens because their pests and pathogens didn't come with them when they were imported. So that's not necessarily a trait that's desirable. We, we want them to be part of the ecosystem. We want some leaf, leaf holes and chews and things like that. Um, they're unaltered from their natural forms. Well, clearly, you know, there's an argument <clears throat> that's ongoing about, you know, native cultivars versus straight species. Uh, I'm, a, I'm in the straight species camp, uh, mostly out of respect 
and acknowledgement of my ignorance. <laughs> um, you know, we just don't know when you change something, how does that affect its role in the food web? Um, we just don't know for the most part. We can guess, we can hope, we can do a lot of things like that. But when you use the straight species, there's no guessing required or hoping required. You know it's going to be part of the ecosystem, part of the food web. And obviously we want to support our neighbor to fauna and that's just a, a backup argument to for a sort of cultivar versus straight species argument. And yeah, it just really depends on how you want to use them. Um, you can make them as manicured as you want, very socially acceptable. Um, you can start taking a little step out and make it a little more English garden-y um, or you can go full on native plant meadow and, um, you know, one of the things that I've, I've uh, suggested in the past, and people do this on their own, but, you know, make a patch, <clears throat> make a defined area with your meadow patch. <clears throat> and then your neighbors all of a sudden recognize that this is planned, it's not out of control, everything's kosher. Um, you know, you still live there and you're still actively trying to keep things looking nice. You could have a meadow patch and it really does sort of um, in, in particular situations, um, depending on where you live, this might be the best way to go. You know, and this is obviously the reward. You know, I, I've I'm, obviously I'm a little into native plants, so I have many thousands of them um, over the years. And, you know, I just took these pictures over like a week or two. And it's just amazing what, what is brought to you. Uh, when you have lots of native plants go on, going on. Um, all, all manner of caterpillars here. Um, these are even more fun on the bottom. This obviously blown up, but very dramatically colored crab uh, spider. Um, this assassin bug eating this little, uh, little caterpillar that was eating my rose mallows that were still growing in their flat that I grew from seed. Um, I mean, it just, this looks like it's stepped right off of, you know, casting for rainforest, uh, you know, rainforest uh, documentary. And the, these kind of things are also just amazing. Um, you know, so this is an assassin bug. And at first I thought it was a bee that had turned the tide on his, his attacker until someone corrected me gently at a, at a presentation I was doing and said, no, that's a robber fly that's looking like a bee. So, you know, just amazing things start happening. Obviously, the more native, you can put a small amount of native plants in and get some and get a bang for your buck. I'm not saying you need thousands of plants, plant a few if that's all you have room for, you're going to get something good. But the more you put in, the more um, your, your yard, your property becomes part of an ecosystem. And uh, yeah, uh, uh, <coughs> Wade and Sharon Wander supplied me with some great photos along the way. But I had a hackberry and just going back to leaf holes. I had this isn't a picture from my hackberry tree, but I started seeing hack, holes in my hackberry saplings that had been coming up because I've been protecting an area from deer. And I was just so excited. I kept turning these over until I found one of these guys. They're just absolutely amazing creatures. So yeah, how do you deal with deer? Um, this poor dejected looking soul has created quite an ugly exclosure. Um, and I think we could do better than that. Um, but you know, if you have, you know, hundreds of possible native plant species, and then you get draw it down to tens that are deer resistant, you know, that's a little depressing. Um, you could still do it without, without fencing. If you really select from that small amount of natives that are fairly resistant. Um, but I think we could, you know, use fencing a lot more in, in, in creative ways to really expand our palette and again, expand our, our properties function as being part of an ecosystem. And, you know, there's so many different things, you know, there's so many different ways to approach this. You know, the one on the right was clearly, you know, sort of a rustic engineer type built this, <laughs> you know, it's, it's very structured, it's very neat, it's very symmetrical. Um, and bottom line, it's effective or you can, you know, be a little bit more artistic about it, you know? So they have a low metal fence here, and then they have these, this, you know, uh, you know, dead wood, probably cedar, I'm assuming, um, 
you know, posts and, and cross posts and things like that, it, it, that works just as well. Now, everything you put inside of it could be whatever the heck you want, whatever natives you want. And you know, using your house as part as one wall of the fence is is a great way to go about it too. So you save a bunch of materials and the time it takes to put it up. Again, you could be as structured as you want. You know, this one might be a little low, but you might be able to put like another foot or so guy wire on top of it. You know, keep in mind that when when you do when we do deer disclosures for a restoration, it's going to be at least seven and a half foot tall. Um, you know, these are in you know natural areas or semi-natural areas. We're returning to more natural condition, but um, and deer can get a running start in. They're large the areas that you're exploding is large, so they can jump in and feel free to get a running start and jump back out again. So you got to have to be very tall. But when you make a relatively small area, um, deer don't feel comfortable jumping into an area that they can't easily jump out of. And it's just their nature. So you can go to four or five feet tall, um, maybe in some cases three, if it's a very narrow area of fencing and you got all the protection that, you know, a restoration fence at seven and a half feet tall in the middle of nowhere has. So, you know, it doesn't have to be some monstrosity, you know, right up against your house that looks like you're, you know, a your house has been turned into a prison. You know, it could be much lower um, and, and any style that you can imagine. Um, the whimsical one, the, the very structured, very neat one. This is absolutely my all-time favorite, the wood pallet fence. I love it, absolutely love it, the redneck fence. Um, and they have a little bit of a guy wire on top that you can see that they added a little extra height to it. But that's, that's all it takes. That's that, and actually they're using their, their fence or their neighbor's fence as one of the other sides. But that's all it takes and you can grow whatever you want inside. The other and one last idea is the double fence idea. So you could have two, whatever, four foot tall fences if the strip is fairly narrow in between and you can get that protection. So there's a variety of options. And, and, I, and I hope that, you know, lots of people will sort of creatively use fencing concepts to, to really expand their palette of natives because it's a problem I hear over and over again that I'd love to grow more natives, but the deer just destroy everything. So this is one way uh, something that we really should probably ramp up. Um, another way is, um, <clears throat> you know, deer repellents. Um, I live in a fairly rural area and I was using this product for many years. Every three weeks you go out, it works. You keep the deer off of whatever you're trying to protect for at least a three week period or thereabouts. Um, unfortunately, this product is about quadrupled in price over the last year or so. Um, I assume it's pandemic related. Um, and I've switched to this one. I just started trying it. It appears to work as well. You know, and I just found these through doing, you know, whatever, you know, web searches and highly rated and, you know, reading lots of reviews and trying to avoid reviews that are made or generated by the manufacturer <laughs> um, so that I could try to get a real review. And um, I'd say that either of these products seem to work. Um, if you live in a more suburban area where there's a lower proportion of sort of natural landscapes, absolutely you're going to have more of a problem than someone in a rural area who's using a deer repellent. So I've been in some places where they just seem to chew through any repellent I put out there. Um, and just sort of one word of warning. You know, you can make homemade recipes of repellents, you know, cayenne pepper, this, that, the other thing. I think they're much more prone to being washed off immediately by rain. These types of products apparently have some kind of sticker in them. You know, almost like, you know, you put a surfactant in when you spray a plant with herbicide because it gets into the wax of the leaf. I think these things have, have stickers in them that make it rain not much of an issue or not as much of an issue. So as far as home remedies versus purchase things, I don't know what the secret chemistry is on these, but they these things do not wash off. And I've done the homemade stuff. Rain, your protection's gone. These, it could rain however many times, it's just gonna take whatever it is, the weather is, a few weeks later, you're gonna have to reapply it. So just again, something else that you can do um, on whatever scale you can manage spraying 
every three weeks. Excuse me, just briefly, Mike, if you yeah. could speak up a little bit. Some of the folks are saying they're having trouble hearing you. Oh, really? Okay. Um, you just get a little closer to your speaker. Thank you. Okay. Doc. Okay, so these are just completely ripped off slides from Deb Ellis, but I wanted to put them in here. And, and the, this presentation will be available. I can make it available for anyone that would want it. Um, but I, if anyone has heard Deb Ellis speaking, she's fantastic. And um, she shared some slides with me recently and I wanted to just make sure these were in there. So these are deer resistant uh, species. I won't go through the whole list because like I said, I think this is a, a good resource for people and I'm, I'm very happy to share this presentation. Um, and Deb shared these with me. So these are a bunch of um, deer resistant native shrubs. So if fencing or deer spray isn't as good of an option for you, then you know here's some really solid, good native species that have uh, some level of deer resistance. And she also covered native ground, uh, ground covers and, and wildflowers. So you know th these are things that you should be considering, um, you know, especially if you can't get any kind of fencing up or a, any kind of deer repellent going on a regular basis. Okay, so um, I'm gonna sort of look at this as types and functions of plants. Um, meadows, foundation planting, screenings, ground cover, shade gardens. <clears throat> um, and, um, you know, point out species that many of which are deer resistant. I'll point out whether they're deer resistant or not um, along the way. So one thing that I wanted to um, throw out there because you know, thinking about maintenance and, and ecological function and value. And, you know, one thing that a lot of people are, are starting to do more and more is creating meadow patches in their yards. So this person is in Pennington in Mercer County. You can see this is the back fence of the, their, their property line. This whole back part of their property wasn't getting a ton of use. Um, and the owner wanted to have, you know, lots of native wildflowers. So they had a space, there was just lawn that wasn't in great shape and wasn't getting used very much. So they basically rid themselves of it, uh, rid themselves of this lawn and they threw a seed mix down and here's the first germination. And this is after a couple of years, maybe even less. It was one of the fastest meadow restorations I've ever seen in my life, but knockout from useless to knockout and an amazing ecological function. So I won't go into the details of this. Again, this if people want the, the presentation, this could be a resource. Um, there's, there's certainly other, other resources for starting a meadow. But one thing that I'll just point out is if you can't do this whole meadow thing all at once, you know, consider doing a stepwise restoration. So if, if you just stop mowing your lawn, the ecological function goes up immediately you at the very least start getting grasshoppers and things like that, which, you know, birds could eat. Um, but, and then if you want to, you could eliminate the grass in small patches, you know, so about one square foot is about one plant. You could mix match, match buying plugs, plug trays or individual pots of, of natives or, and seeds. So you, so you can mix and match these things. And then you just could have, you know, that stepwise approach, continue adding things every year. So, you know, there's, um, you can take something that, you know, maybe a project that's a little bit too big for you at any one particular time and convert it into something that's becomes useful pretty quickly. And then every year you add more ecological function to it. So just another, another thing to consider when for uh, getting native plants into your yard. So thinking about some of the invasive species and counterparts, there's sort of a, at least a few different categories. And, you know, folks for the, the chat or the Q&A afterward, um, you know, you could throw in other species that you might want to think about what, what um, replacements are and, and people that are uh, participants could, you know, chime in as well if they know something, a good replacement. But you know, sometimes it's relatively easy. There's native native relatives that are that are that are out there. 
So Chinese wisteria has American wisteria. Asiatic bittersweet has American bittersweet. Uh, Boston ivy has Virginia creeper. Who's a dogwood has American dogwood uh, or flowering dogwood. You know, so sometimes it's real simple. There's, there's a, a very close relative that does something that um, very similar to the, the invasive species. Um, you know, I think anytime anyone could argue that, well, the Asian wisterias are more, have more flowers or they grow faster or, or whatever the case may be. And there's always arguments that anyone can make to sort of scuttle why they need the invasive and not the native. But, you know, it, for species like this, it becomes way more of a stretch um, because there is such a close one-to-one -one comparison. You know, ones that maybe have a slightly better argument, but, you know, it's all, you know, personal opinion and whatnot. But, you know, wineberry, you know, well, there's black cap raspberry. I'm not going to lie to you, wineberry is way sweeter. <laughs> um, black cap raspberry is delicious, but let's be serious. Wineberry is way more delicious. Um, I've still killed every single one on my property, um, but you know, they are delicious. So if, if your argument is you want these things right in your backyard, well, I wish you wouldn't, but um, I, it's going to be hard for me to argue that there's a native that's quite as delicious. Um, butterfly bush. Well, I could say purple giant hyssop is a pretty good butterfly plant. Um, does it flower as long throughout the year as butterfly bush? No, on a one-to-one -one replacement, it doesn't make flowers as long as butterfly bush. Would I ever, if I saw one in a natural area, would I kill it? Absolutely, I would. Um, but I, I'm, I, I can't argue that there's one native plant that completely replaces places it, mostly because the flowering time is so long. Um, the uh, burning bush, <laughs> or, or calorie pear, if I'm going clockwise here. Um, Sure, shad bush is a pretty decent replacement. Um, maybe not quite as long flowering. Uh, maybe doesn't get quite as big, obviously, but you know it's a native that produces an abundance of white flowers. But maybe not quite as long. Well, one advantage that it does have is that their flowers don't stink like calorie pear. But um, and then burning bush, you knock it. You can put high bush blueberry or something else that gets really good fall color, but man, burning bush, that's pretty amazing fall color. Would I kill it? Absolutely. I'm not saying that we should plant these or I would plant these or encourage anyone to plant these, but I could see arguments why you could say, well, it's not exactly a one-to-one -one replacement out there. And then there's species that are really hard to find an exact or, or a comparable native. Um, you know, Japanese maple, yeah, I guess, you know, you could say, oh, maybe ironwood's a small tree, but mm, still not quite the ar ar architectural beauty that a Japanese maple has. Um, Chinese silver grass, you know, it's hard to find a native grass that's that stout um, and large and tall. Um, there really aren't any particularly great native evergreen uh, vines for New Jersey, like English ivy or, or winter creeper. Um, mimosa, yeah, I don't think there's any native that's even close to that. Uh, barberry, I don't know, I think they're pretty ugly to be honest with you, but you know, there's not an exact copy of that, but there's things you could suggest like say Virginia sweet spire, but it's not clearly a one-to-one -one anymore. And then weeping hig and cherry, um, which are becoming quite invasive, by the way, um, and are not, and when they revert in, from seed, they are not weeping most of the time, but it is still the same species. They, they um, breed back to their original non-weeping form. Um, but, you know, that, that's a really tall tree with a lot of flowers on it. You know, there's really not a great native comparison to that. And at, at some level, I think the find me a replacement and then I'll stop growing invasive argument is a trap. I, I really do feel that it's a bit of a trap. You know, I think there's plenty of natives and that's what I'll show you some photos of the rest of the way out of, of great natives that work in different places. 
but I, I, I really do um, feel like it's a trap. I can't, I can't put it in any other way. It feels like a trap. If there's not a one-to-one -one replacement, well, then I'm just going to use the invasive, you know, and, and I think it's more about right plant for right place kind of a situation. There's absolutely plenty of native species that could be used in your landscape, that, that there'd be no need to, to plant a mimosa or something else. Although they have a unique beauty to them, um, if your goal is to have uh, a landscape that respects um, nature, um, not just for pleasing your eye, um, you know, you could look at native plants and there's plenty of beautiful ones, but you might have to forego the mimosa. There's no count. Um, so yeah, the, the, the milkweeds are obviously, a um, you know, a great, um, a great source of native, native plants that are very, very deer resistant, you know, so you got your butterfly milkweed, the, the orange, you got swamp milkweed, you have purple milkweed, you have common milkweed, you know, all of these are phenomenal species and they all have a role, you know. These three guys, you know, could be in a very neat garden bed if you wanted them. They're pretty well behaved. Common milkweed, not that well behaved, more of a meadow kind of a guy, because um, it will run and make new shoots, and that's fantastic. Um, it seems to me that they get the most pollinator visits, although they all get plenty of pollinator visits, but it seems like common milkweed has, has that uh, a little bit of an advantage on, on ecological function. Um, but they're all fantastic, you know? So yeah, this was a great year for fritillaries in my yard, just little patches, just coated with, with fritillaries, purple milkweed, just look at all these pollinators all at once, all kinds of cool bee species that I never noticed before. And then you get your crab spider eating some fly. So, you know, it, it's, it's such a great plant to have in your yard. And, um, you know, I guess someone could say, what's the invasive counterpart? I don't care. This is fantastic. Just use the native species for crying out loud. <laughs> you know, it's not that, that we don't have to get wrapped up in that argument. Um, foxglove, beer tongue, very deer resistant, amazing bee species. Um, hairy beer tongue, also a very good pollinator species, very bulletproof. The beer tongues you have to be a little careful of in a meadow situation because they tend to get overwhelmed over time by other other species. Um, they're per, both great for a regular garden bed, um, and if you want to keep them in a meadow, you might want to put them towards the edges of the meadow because they tend to get overwhelmed over time. Um, you know, you can go with grasses. Broom sedge, blue stem is is probably one of the tamer you know, roughly three foot ish um, native grass, you know, and there's certain things that, that need it, um, like this Indian skipper. Um, Indian grass, I would not recommend in a bed, a planting bed, because um, they will get, you know, seven feet tall <laughs> when they're feeling really healthy. So great for a meadow or along the back, back of your property line. So again, just a matter of how do you use these things? Would either of these things replace Chinese silver grass? next to your mailbox on the roadside? Probably not, um, but they have their roles and you, if you find where to use them, they have you know, great, great beauty and value. Uh, horseman, very deer resistant, incredibly beautiful. Uh, red banded hair streaks. They're also, you get some very unique wasp species that come to them, not, not things that are gonna sting you because you're looking at them. Um, but they do tend to attract wasps, uh, different wasp species. Bleh, wasp species. Um, wild bergamot, you know, so maybe you use wild bergamot and purple giant hyssop to replace but butterfly bush. So you might need a little bit of a combo going on. But both, both of the bergamot and the purple giant hyssop are amazing for butterflies. Silver spotted skippers, um, tiger swallowtails, and, and others. Uh, but there, there's options out there. Um, so sometimes it's not so simple. Is there a one-to-one -one replacement for butterfly bush? I don't think so, but you can easily find a combination of two or more natives that could easily um, replace butterfly bush. 
and have been brought and bring plenty of butterflies to your yard. Um, <clears throat> and this is just a large scale, beautiful picture and sort of a restoration. It was a, a, a tension basin in one of the Phobos board members' backyards and he got all the permissions required. That little person there is, is, is his daughter who you can clearly see on the useless grass in the detention basin. And that was restored and became the so when there's bigger victories to have, it's great when you can get them, uh, converting a huge detention basin to a wildflower meadow. But you're going to get great stuff even if you make a 10 by 10 meadow in your yard too. So, um, but it is always good to look for some bigger victories when you can get them. And I think there's plenty of room for shade meadows. You know, it's very hard to think of how seeding in a wooded or shaded area would work. But you can certainly buy plants and plugs and things like that for a for a, a meadow type situation in a shaded spot. You know, violets, absolutely stunning. Ferns, um, golden ragwort, with that may apple and ferns all together. This has all, all kinds of things. But you know, don't forget your shady spots. You know, we think of meadows as sunny, sunny, sunny. You know, we could have that kind of concept with a mixed mixture of great native species and shade as well. You know, so some of the elements of that, <clears throat> um, you know, miter warts and foam flower, you know, each have their own merits. Miter warts a little bit more tame than foam flower, but come on, the petals each look like a snowflake, so how can you beat that? Um, so you know, these are two really neat uh, ground covers. Wild ginger, um, another amazing native ground cover. You're not likely to see these flowers unless you creep along the ground like I do, but these flowers were present when I looked down and saw only leaves. So, you know, um, it's kind of fun to find things. Uh, and, and ginger makes a great ground cover. Green and gold, obvious beauty here. Um, alum root. I had some of these and I was not overwhelmed by how beautiful the flowers were, but then I saw this amazing group of tiny, the tiniest little solitary bees that you can imagine all over them, like a cloud. I'm like, well, I think that should stay. Um, you know, black cohosh can be exceedingly difficult to find, but it's a very beautiful and, and you know, fairly deer resistant. Uh, plant. Uh, bleeding hearts, you know, so do we need the ones that have flowers that are twice as big and are bicolored and everything else? Maybe they have the same ecological function, maybe they don't, I, I don't know, but what the heck is wrong with the straight species? That's an absolutely gorgeous flower. Um, white wood aster, if you don't have something protecting this from deer, it will disappear quickly. Um, but it has, you know, obviously great value for pollinators in September. Columbines are pretty darn bulletproof, but someone told me recently that they had some of that being eaten from their yard, which was shocking to me. Also, another species, native species, have been around a long time and has been cultivated quite a bit. But there's, you know, the, the, the native species as it occurs in nature is, is quite stunning. Cardinal flowers, similar, they have a very good deer resistance, hummingbirds, butterflies, et cetera, a great one. All the ferns are deer resistant. Um, so, you know, combination of all those things can, can give you a fantastic sort of meadow-like appearance in shaded conditions. I'm gonna go through these a little bit more quickly because um, I think I have about, or less than 10 minutes left. Um, but yeah, like I said, this is a resource, this, this presentation, if anyone wants it. So yeah, low bush blueberry, that gives you that great burning bush-like color, um, pretty darn red, and, and you could also eat some fruit. Deer will hit it, maybe not to extinction, but maybe more than you'd want it to be hit. So you might need some protection on this. Great, great um, foundation planting plant because it's not very tall. Um, huckleberry, extremely difficult to get. I should probably remove this from my presentation because it's kind of a tease, um, but they are really bulletproof. I, I, I wish there was ways that these could be propagated more easily than apparently it is, but they are really bulletproof. Um, and they make brown elfins very happy. 
Um, sweet fern, really deer resistant, really bulletproof. Another good potential for a foundation plant. Virginia Sweet Spire, another good choice. Pretty darn deer resistant, uh, gorgeous flowers. Another, you know, reasonable plant for a foundation planting. Um, maybe not right in front of the windows, might get a little too tall depending on your house, but, you know, obviously stunning. New Jersey Tea, another great uh, foundation plant. Doesn't get too tall. Great if you're a banded hair streak. Um, and lots of other things will come and visit them as well. <clears throat> and then screening, lots of screening options. Again, I'm, I'm sort of purposely leading away a bit from the, how does this replace a particular invasive in favor of, these are great natives that you could use in particular situations. Um, Eastern red cedar. Um, I have plenty of those around. I wish I could see a juniper hair streak. Man, is that gorgeous? Um, and the, the fruits are the, I will get into body. The fruits are, um, you know, really loved. I get huge flocks of robins on mine every year. Hollies, clearly. Um, and, you know, for me, who are a plant guy, I'm like, Henry's, Henry's who? Um, never heard of these guys. Pretty cool looking, but like, I'm mostly focused on the plants. And then sort of in the back of my mind, I know there's a lot of things that are enjoying this other than me. Uh, bayberry, you can do pretty much anything you want. You can make it, this would be a good replacement for privet hedge um, because you can hedge trimmer the thing into a perfect squared off thing. Um, you know, obviously there's the native clematis, obviously very stunning. I will say that it does send to, to pop up around your garden. Not that that's a huge problem, but don't expect it to stay perfectly in place. Um, trumpet honeysuckle, much more likely to stay in place, um, can get outrageous um, amounts of flowers and get very dense and become a screen and great for hummingbirds and, and white lined sphinx moth. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the end of the presentation. I'm happy to take questions or discuss things or whatever. There I am. Thank you so much, Mike. Uh, that was a wonderful presentation. I loved all your slides. Um, you'll have to come over and, and uh, visit my uh, juniper hair streaks that come to my junipers because wow. um, we do get them here. Cool. Just had, I just had to brag about that a little bit. <laughs> um, so we've got a lot of really great questions. Um, I thought we'd try to you know, sort of take some of the, 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 the bigger ones that came along. Um, one that I, I wanted to throw out uh, early on was um, Several folks were surprised to discover some plants that they were interested in putting into their landscape, such as Japanese maple, were invasive. Yeah. Um, and I'll, this, this, I'll, I'll throw, throw this one to you easy, Mike. Is there a place where they can find a list of plants that are invasive in New Jersey that they might not want to plant in their landscape? Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the strike team has a do not plant list. There's other you know, similar lists, I guess, out there in the world, but, you know, we do have a good technical group and I'm sort of proud of them um, and their knowledge. So every year we update our do not plant list. And um, so our 2021 list is still up there, but by the end of the month, our 2022 list will be there. So it's a conservative list, um, but I could just say, I'm not looking to create trouble and I'm not looking to make stuff up. You know, it's conservative, but I have seen Japanese maple on a regular basis escaping into natural areas. It's not a made up thing. Um, they're clearly starting from seed, ending up in the woods. So yeah, I mean, there's some very beloved non-native species that um, it is what it is. They're, they're, they are invasive or they're becoming invasive. Um, I've, I loved, I grew up loving mimosa. My neighbor across the street had it. I was fascinated by how gorgeous it was. So much to my chagrin, when I was getting reports, especially from South Jersey, just popping up all over the place. And I found some in Hopewell. And like I said, I'm, I'm pretty merciless about it. You know, like 
I, I saw the mimosa at our one of our preserves and I didn't say, oh, my childhood memories of beautiful flowers. I'm like, I got to get out here and kill this thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, you got to put, you got to sort of, the sort of harsh way to put it is, it isn't just about you, <laughs> you know, it isn't about what you think looks beautiful or what, what is beautiful, but it is, it's about the ecological, preserving our natural areas. And protecting our natural areas. So a follow up to that uh, again. This is this is combining a few different questions that different different folks had. Why is it? Well, first of all, two part question. Why is it that so many of the plants that are available in garden centers are not native? Why are some of them actually invasive? And is New Jersey doing anything to make it? Um, more difficult to sell invasive species in New Jersey? Yeah. Um, well, one of the reasons they're grown is because of that, the characters that invasives have. So they have a wide tolerance to light and soil conditions. They're disease free. Um, nothing will touch them and eat them, which is horrible. Uh, but that's why they get sold. Because, you know, especially for a casual person that just said, hey, I just, um, my neighbor got these great shrubs and now I, and they look great and I want to get something to make my house look better too. And you go to the, you know, the big box store and you're like, oh, that was probably Japanese barberry. The deer don't eat it. Oh, that's exactly what I want. You know, so you get a lot of that happening. Um, and as far as, you know, there's been efforts going back, you know, whatever, 10 or 15 years with the former New Jersey Invasive Species Council. And um, I had drafted the plan for, for them um, with lots of recommendations worked out over many years and it was thrown in the circular file. And there is current legislation that has been introduced um, and it may not be perfect. I mean, I could certainly think of ways to improve it, but, and there's who knows whether, whether it'll get passed or not. But at least there's something that's been introduced. Some people are thinking about it. Legislators are thinking about it, um, and I hope that it will move forward. You know, and I, and I think the way to make it move forward is just like sort of anything else. If I still contend that the biggest problem we have with protecting nature is that not enough people care. I mean, quite frankly, out of the entire population, you know, not enough people care enough to make our representatives do something and you know we have to push you know we have to push them we have to speak up more we have to most importantly bring more people into the fold who do care deeply about this and hopefully at some point that gets converted into real action and that that uh, brings up another question that someone asked um there were several questions about deer. Why has the deer population increased so much? And, and uh, uh, there was a question in chat and someone basically said there are no predators left. Uh, I believe Mike Jacobs uh, led in with that. But there's also a lot of communities now that um, they still feel very protective against their, uh, towards their deer. Uh, sort of the, oh, you can't hurt Bambi um, sort of rules. Um, what, what do you think it's going to take for New Jersey to get serious about managing the deer population? Yeah, it, it's a it's an extremely complicated um, sort of matrix of interests. Um, if anyone's interested, again, I could share a link. We at, at Friends of Hopewell Valley, we try to put a um, put it together because I've been getting that question so many times over the years. Why is why does nothing ever change? And um, <clears throat> so we, we call them our stakeholder slides and we have who are, who are the stakeholders? What are, what are the things they do that help the situation? What are the things they do that don't help the situation? And I'd be happy to share that because it is way more complicated than it might, you might think. And, and there's some strange bed fellows in there as well. Um, namely like sometimes animal activists, animal rights activists and hunters being on the same side. Just to give you a little teaser. Um, <laughs> um, so, you know, I, I think there's a lot of the interest that want a lot of deer. Um, 
win and the folks that are, are very hesitant about real serious deer control, they are sort of part of, you know, the, the lack of critical mass needed to have real change happen. So there's people that really want a lot of deer. There's people that aren't quite sure if we should do something about it. You add those two together, that group controls those that see our forest being destroyed and are very concerned. So, you know, there, there's combinations of things out there. Um, why this problem has been hard to solve or it hasn't been solved. Um, and for the seeable future, again, unless more people start caring and banding together, um, we're going to have this problem. And why there's so many deer is, well, yeah, there's no natural predators. There's tons of land that cannot be hunted at all. And there's the majority of the rest of the land is hunted with the idea of we don't really want to reduce the deer population. So, you know, that's why we are where we're at. Um. Veering away from that a little bit, but staying with deer a little bit. Um, several people pointed out when you were talking about fence heights and fence styles and uh, allowing your lawn to grow and develop um, uh, meadow patches instead of your lawn. Uh, several folks pointed out that, for example, a lot of municipalities have fence ordinances where you can't put in a fence higher than four feet. Mm -hmm which isn't going to do you much good against your average deer herd. Um, and also um, a lot of municipalities have, have a basically a lawn maintenance, um, lawn maintenance ordinances. You cannot allow your lawn to grow. Do you have any thoughts on whether or not municipalities are starting to uh, rethink some of those ordinances? Um, I think I I, I'm a little weak on let regulations, but I, I'm, quite sure that it, I believe it was at the state level that there was a rule passed that you could have a meadow in your yard and no one could say, well, they could say boo about it, but they can't have any control over it and no municipality could override it. So there, there are, there is, I believe, state legislation that allows for you to make a meadow in your yard. You know, just whatever the scorn of your neighbors might be the only thing left, but, you know, <laughs> they, you know some neighbors don't appreciate it, but, um, so I believe you're, there's nothing to stop you from doing it. And as far as fence height, a four foot can work if you are not enclosing a large area. That's true. So I think, you know, yes, there, there are absolutely municipal ordinances out there on fence height. So if you wanted to put a seven and a half foot fence up, you might have, a, you might have to get a variance and it might be something you're successful with or not. I know there's been several in Hopewell that were successful and they have very tall fences up. Um, but um, you can get away with a smaller fence um, if the area you're enclosing isn't very large. So one thing we've done and I've done on my own property is buy a 50 foot roll of you know galvanized you know metal mesh fencing and whatever area that encircles that five foot fence can make the perimeter being 50 foot deer will not jump into it it's too small so that just gives you some sense of that area to to height kind of argument i did see that uh, john mccary commented and this is uh at least i know in local ordinances where i am this is absolutely true even where there's fence ordinances there's usually not a hedge ordinance so if you can't put in a tall fence, putting in a tall hedge may work for you. Yeah, um, yeah. And and I've and I'm quite frankly, and I'm not encouraging anyone to break the law, but I do know of some um, tall fences that have been hidden in and amongst tall hedges. <laughs> um, the um, it was a question about. Uh, I mean, we're really focusing on deer. There were a lot of question on deer um, when you were talking about deer repellents. Again, I'm going to give you a two part question here. Um, one was whether or not the deer repellents also repel pollinators. And the second question was, what about um, uh, predator urine, blood meal, uh, and something that I'm not familiar with called milogranite as a deer um, repellent? I'm not sure what that is either. Sounds like um, uh, some kind of mineral or something. Um, yeah. I, I don't know. It, it, so 
you know, all of those things, if they wash away in rain, they're only going to work to the extent that it hasn't rained since you last put it down. <laughs> so I think that's one of the key, that, that's my assumption. If someone else knows more particular and better, that's, you know, please type it in the chat or whatever. But my assumption is anything that can be washed away with rain works until the day it rains. And, um, you know, so I think those, those, the ones you buy, the commercial ones that you buy, uh, you know, I think it seems they work longer than it rains. And my assumption is they have a sticker in them and that gets into the wax of the leaf and holds, holds itself on there. Although I can't smell it past an hour or so after putting it on, um, the deer apparently can, or they could taste it. Um, so I, I think that's, that's the, the heart of the argument on deer repellents. It's not so much what it is exactly as it is, does it stay past rain, essentially. But do they repel pollinators, Mike? I have no idea. If someone else has an idea on that, I, I have no clue. I assume not, because I see pollinators on plants that I deer spray. But it's not like I measured it scientifically and found out that there's 25% less pollinators now that I spray them. But they do seem to get plenty of pollinators after spraying. Um, but I can't speak to it in a scientific way for sure. There's, uh, I think we'll just take a couple more questions here because um, time is, time is getting on. Um, one, uh, if you wanted to talk a little bit about Japanese knotweed, which was an invasive species that you didn't touch on at all. Yeah. Um, uh, someone was quite interested to hear your thoughts on that. Um, it's a horrible one. It's one of the hardest ones to kill for sure. Um, the Department, New Jersey Department of Agriculture last year started trials on a biocontrol agent. So that's promising. Let's hope it's promising. Um, but there's something that they're testing on it because that's the only way you're going to get control at any scale is to have a biological control agent. Um, as far as killing it, um, I follow the lead of Art Gover, who's on our technical committee, the weed guru from Penn State. Um, and the method of control that he has researched is basically letting it get tall to about June, cut it down to the ground, let it come up a few feet later in the summer, spray it with glyphosate. And the, the concept um, is that anything that has a massive root system, if you just spray it when it's full size without doing anything ahead of time, it just, it might go down for the year and it might just come up and it'll come up the next year like nothing happened. I've seen this on miles of roadside over the years. It just gets sprayed year after year after year. Um, and what you do by letting it come up only using a ton of root energy, you cut that off and you basically subtract it from their roots because that new shoot hasn't resupplied the, the root. Then it grows up again using more root energy, then you nail it with the herbicide. Um, and if you're not an herbicide person, that concept of repeatedly cutting, but letting it get a certain height before you recut it with the assumption that every time you cut it in a well-timed way, you're going to reduce the power of the roots. So, you know, uh, you know, that's what Art Gover has found. You could do cut stump method on it as well. If you don't have a billion stems, um, injection methods are out there. So there's, there's other ways to try to kill it, but um, I, I tend to follow Art's suggestion. Yeah, I think, I think we'll go with one more question here. Um, this was, um, someone asked you about the pros and cons of reporting invasive species. So when they encounter invasive species in a wild area, reporting them on iNaturalist, or I, I believe, um, the invasive species strike team has a way to report invasive species as well, doesn't it, Mike? Yeah, correct. Yeah, we have um, we have a phone app. It's now it's sort of been incorporated into EdMaps, um, E D D M A P S, and there's a New Jersey dropdown. So you could um, basically get the strike team's list that we've developed within that EdMaps uh, phone app. So we rely on that quite a bit, you know, I mean, it's, it's our, we can't, as much as we're out there, we're not out there as much as all the other people that are out in the woods, <laughs> you know, we're, we're just limited, obviously. 
So the more observations we get, the more we learn. You know, um, you know, sometimes people say, oh, Mike, you know a lot about invasives. Well, it's only because the thousands of people have told me everything they know about them. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's kind of cheating, um, but I'll take it, sure. Um, you know, but, you know, it's really helpful if people supply their, their information. Um, and, and it's most beneficial to us through the app. But I'm learning more and more that that iNaturalist is pretty good too, and I know the folks at EdMaps have been uh, beginning to incorporate iNaturalist into their bigger database. So, um, you know, so those are the options out there. The the, the value that our, the EdMaps with our sort of New Jersey personalized list brings is um, it's narrowing down the options for you in a way. Um, but you know, yeah, iNaturalist is pretty darn good too, but you could sort of, you could probably use both apps. It's, um, uh, are, there, are there any cons at all that you can think of? Is there, is there any downside to an individual for reporting an invasive species population that they see? I am a uh, scientist, so there is never a downside to more data. Never, <laughs> ever, ever. It's all good. The more more it's reported, the more we learn, the, the better. Well, thanks so much, Mike. This has been terrific. I wanted to remind everyone that's on that this was recorded this evening. Um, there were a lot of questions about, could you show that sl this slide again? Could you show that slide again? Could you show uh, that list again? You can go to npsnj.org uh, as well as our YouTube channel, and you'll be able to see uh, this presentation, you can skim through it and look at all the lists that Mike had up and get all that information all over again. Um, is there anything you'd like to, to leave us with? Any final thought, Mike, before we, uh, we let everyone go for the evening? No, uh, you know, I'm sure you're already, you're already on the right side here, but yeah, plant more natives. There we go. There we go. Thanks so much, Mike. Really appreciate having you this evening. Thanks everyone for coming and uh, go to mpsnj.org, uh, become a member and check out all the good stuff on our website. Thanks very much, everyone. Good night.